Man, I'm glad we're having church in the house today. Man, you guys are killing it. Can I just say thank you for being so awesome? Can we just, can we just thank these guys? Man, I don't get to say that a lot because I'm up here with them. You guys can sit down. I know you're like, please, can I sit down? My feet hurt. But you can sit down. Man, I'm so excited about what God has for us today. And I say that because God's already done a work in my heart leading up to today. And I think it's the craziest thing when, I don't know how many of you have ever written a message or prepared a word from the Lord, but when he guides your fingers when you're typing in Microsoft Word, and then you sit down on Saturday night to look over it, and his spirit preaches to you before you set foot on the platform. It's something. And so last night I'm sitting and I'm reading and I'm reading the notes that I've written and God spoke to me. And I just had to have a moment alone with him. And so today, I pray that these words that he guided my hands to write and the word that he gave me from his word will do the same in your hearts today. So let's get started. You ready? We're starting a new series today. It's called David. One word, David. And so you don't really have to be in church for a long time. You don't have to have grown up in church to know about David, right? We've all heard the stories. We've heard of David and, all right, come on. I need, I need, I need a little bit more than that. We've heard of David and, there we go. We've heard of David and Goliath. We've heard of David and Bathsheba and his sin with her. And we, we can learn a lot of lessons from those. But there's over 66 chapters in the Bible and over 1,000 references to the life of David in the Bible. And so there's more stories than this, those two or just more stories than the ones that we have highlighted in our memory banks from when we were in Sunday school and all the stories that we've heard growing up. There's so much that we can learn from the life of David. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be sharing some different stories of his life. And the common ground is David. And we're going to learn what we can take from his life and apply to our lives. So that's what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. Today, we're going to be looking at the beginning of David's life. I think that's pretty fitting, right? Week one, let's look at the beginning. Let's look at where it started. And so just to give us a little bit of background of where we are in the Bible, um, for those of you that might not know a lot about the life of David, Israel has come out of Egypt. God has delivered them, and he has brought them to the promised land, the land that he had set apart and promised that they would occupy. So they're in the land. They're establishing themselves as a nation. And as they're going through the land and conquering different places and different cities and different people, they notice something that the other nations have that they don't, and that's a king. They see a king ruling on the throne of all these other nations, and they tell God, we want a king for ourselves. We want a king that we can send out and fight our battles for us. And see, up to this point, they didn't have a king. God was their king. God was the one that guided and directed them, and he used different men. He used Moses. He used Joshua, and then he used the time of the judges, and then he spoke through prophets, and that's where we find ourselves in our story right now. God's speaking through his prophet Samuel, but the people are saying, we want a king for ourselves. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. How, does that sound familiar? We're, that, that's us, right? Everybody else has that. I want one too. I want one too, and God says, you know what? I'm tired of listening to them. Give them what they want. He told Samuel, I've chosen a man. His name was Saul. God chose Saul, and Saul became Israel's first king. But see, here's the, here's the thing. Saul was the king the people wanted, not the king they needed. God answered their cry, and he gave them exactly what they wanted. He gave them a man that would wear a crown and go out and fight their battles for them. But he was not the king they needed. And so Saul... Just like so many of us, he tried to do things his own way. He set out to do it his own way. 
and he messed up, and he messed up time and time and time and time again. And finally God says, that's enough. I'm not dealing with this anymore. That's the last straw. And he said, I've rejected Saul. He tells Samuel this. He says, I've rejected Saul. Now I need you to go and anoint the next king of Israel. And so that's where we pick up our story. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If not, we're going to put it on the screen for you. We're going to make it easy. And so 1 Samuel chapter 16, it says this. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? See, Samuel, even God's prophet, was mourning the loss of Saul. Even Samuel wanted him to be king. He believed that God had chosen him. He was the man, and he was mourning for Saul. He says, how long will you mourn for him since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. I'm sending you to Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. God had chosen the next king of Israel. See, before David's name is even mentioned in the Bible, God had started to write his story. God had a plan for David. Before his name is even mentioned the first time, God has chosen him for a purpose. See, some of you here today don't even realize the calling that is on your life. But God has something great in store for you. Can we believe that? God has something great in store for you. You don't even know it yet. You don't even know the things that God's going to use you to do. But he's already started writing your story. He's already started writing. We have no idea the stories that are being written a few feet over on the other side of that wall. Our kids are sitting there with their small group leader, learning about Jesus, learning about the Bible, and God's writing stories on the other side of that wall that we can't even begin to imagine. On the other side of this wall, we've got middle school students sitting down with small group leaders and their youth pastor learning about the Bible and processing what it means to live a life that looks like Jesus. We have no idea the stories that God is writing in this house today. We have no idea. We have no idea, but God is writing a story, and he's got great things in store for you and great things in store for me. What an awesome truth. What an awesome truth. So Samuel obeys God. He goes to Bethlehem. That name sounds familiar, right? There was another king that came from Bethlehem. Man, I love God. I love the, I love the story he has played out through history and in his word, how he's woven it all together. So God sends Samuel to Bethlehem to anoint Israel's next king. So Samuel obeys. He listens to God. He goes to Bethlehem. He goes to Jesse's house. He tells Jesse, God told me to come to you. He wants me to meet all your sons. And so Jesse's like, oh, well, if, if the prophet is here, this has got to be important. So he's like, all right, let me go get him. Let me get my sons. And so we're going to have a little bit of fun. Can we have fun this morning in church? Is that okay? We're going to do something a little bit different. I need, I need seven volunteers. I need, I need seven men. Can I get seven men? Just come on up. I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to pick you out. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Ben, I know she's already pushing you. Get on up here. Travis, Travis, are you back there? Can I use you? Everybody clap for Travis. All right, we got one, two, three, four, five. I need two more, two more. If we're pointing fingers, just push them. It's fine. Patrick, come up here. You have to do what I say. All right. Do we have enough? How many we got? We need one more. What are we doing? What are we doing? I need one more. You see it. You see it. Yeah, come on. All right. You guys line up right here. I need you guys to work together. While I talk to them, I need you all to figure out who's the oldest and who's the youngest. And I need you all to line up. Patrick, you can probably come on down here. That's probably the best thing. All right. 45. Good Lord. All right, while they try to figure out how old they are, if they can remember, we'll see. And they're going to line up. This is uh, Jesse's sons, everybody. Jesse's sons. Can we just give them some love? Let them know. Are y'all lined up? What is happening? Oldest. Oldest to youngest. Only have so much material planned for this part. Oldest to youngest. Look at how quick they're moving now. All right. Jesse's sons. So here's what happens. Samuel comes to Jesse and he says, I need to see your sons. And so Jesse goes and gets his sons and he brings them in and he lines them up. 
And so Samuel takes a look at him, and he looks at the first one. He looks at the oldest, and he's like, that is a king. If I've ever seen, no, nah, I'm questioning, I'm questioning our example this morning, all right? This is just, this is just for kicks. This is just to paint a picture. But he looks at him, he says, Eliab, you look like a king. God, I think this is the man. I think this is the man right here. He, he's the oldest, he's the wisest, he's the smartest, he's the best looking, the best looking one out of all of them. I was hoping this would be Travis, but now it's Jason. But anyway, yeah, I, I, I look at him and this looks like a king. This looks like a king. And so God looks down at Samuel, and I kind of picture him just kind of shaking his head. Like, here we go again. And so in verse 7, God said this. He says, but the Lord said to Samuel. See, God had something he even wanted to teach his prophet right here, something he even wanted to teach the man of God. He said, I got something to teach him. Let's see what he does. It says, but the Lord says to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not, yeah, I know, you're feeling that right now. You're feeling the rejection. He says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He said, I know he might look like a king, but I have rejected him. Can you hold that for me? Hold it boldly, proudly. There we go. I have rejected him. And so Samuel says, oh, man. He looks like a king, but God said, no, I've rejected him. See, Samuel was making the same mistake that Israel had made with their first king. He's looking at him from the outside and saying, hey, he's got all the assets. He's got what it takes. I believe he's the man for the job. And God says, no, we're not doing that again. We did it with Saul. We're not doing it again. See, Saul looked the part, but he didn't have the heart. Saul looked the part, but he didn't have the heart. And God saw the same thing when he looked at Jesse's first son. He says, he doesn't have the heart, so I've rejected him. You see, God isn't concerned with your outward appearance. He doesn't care about the things that everybody else sees. Amen. He doesn't care about how good you look, right? He doesn't care about how good you look. He doesn't care about how good I look. He doesn't care about how expensive your clothes are or how much your haircut costs. See, for some of us, he took care of that already. He said, I'm going to make it easy for you. You don't have to pay for a haircut. You know what I'm talking about? You don't have to pay for a haircut. I'm just going to take it away. I'm going to take the pressure away, you know? And so he said, I don't care how much your haircut costs. I don't care about your fancy clothes and your, your name brand sneakers. And I love sneakers just like the next guy. But God doesn't care about that. That's not what qualifies you to be used by him. He doesn't care about what neighborhood you grew up in or how many degrees are hanging on your wall or you, where you went to college. He doesn't care about the color of your skin or who your parents are. God doesn't look at all the other things that man looks at. God looks right through all the superficial and he looks right to the heart and he judges who he uses based on the heart. He doesn't care about all that other stuff. And so often, we spend so much time, energy, money into the outward appearance, but we don't put any time and energy into the heart. We don't put any time and energy into that. And God says, I don't care about all the stuff that the world looks at. I look at the heart. And so God rejected Eliab. But don't worry. Jesse says, man, I... I thought he would have worked out just fine too. But don't worry. I got six other guys here. I got six other guys. We're going to see what can, what can happen here. And so he starts to go down the line. He looks at number two. And he says, God, if he didn't work out, number two is the man for the job. And you look sharp, by the way. You look the part. But God says, no. Not the man. So we keep going down the line. We look here at number three. Uh-uh. We look at number four. And no. We look at number five. No. Look at number six. Are we really asking this question right now? No. We look at number seven. Nope. And so we've gone through seven. We've gone through seven. And now Samuel's standing there in the room, and he's super confused. He's super confused because we've gone through Jesse's sons. God, you sent me to Bethlehem. You told me to look at Jesse's sons. I've done just that, and you've rejected each and every one of them. God came in, and he had an Oprah Winfrey moment. He said, you get an X. You get an X. You get an X. 
you get an X. You're not qualified. You're not qualified. You might look the part, but you don't have the heart. I've got an extra X. I don't know who that's for. We're going to get rid of that. And so God looked at every one of his sons. Your X is sideways, by the way. Oh, you're just trying to be different. That's why you didn't get chosen. That's because you're rebellious. Amen. And so God looked at every, each and every one of his sons, and he said, they are not qualified. I have rejected them. And so Samuel's confused, and he says, Jesse, I thought I told you to bring all your sons. Are all your sons here? I don't, I don't understand what's going on. And, and Jesse says, well, yeah, at least the ones that I would choose. At least the ones I would choose. And so Samuel says, well, okay, I'm confused because you're saying there's another. You're saying that there's another son that, that is not here. And Jesse said, yeah, but he's the youngest. He's the smallest. He's the most insignificant. He's out in the field doing the work of a servant. And so Samuel says, go get him. Go get him. You guys can take a seat. Thank you so much. Give them a, give them a round of applause for, for serving this morning. So Samuel says, we're not even going to sit down until all your sons are here. We're not even going to take a seat. I need all the sons here. And so they send for David, who's out in the field. And I think it's interesting when we look at this story that Jesse didn't even use David's name. He said, the youngest is out in the field, but you're not interested in him. You've got seven other qualified guys here. Why can't you just take one of them? And Jesse didn't even use David's name. Didn't even use his name. He considered him so insignificant, so undervalued that he didn't even give him the dignity of using his name. And some of you here today, it seems that everyone you know has cast you to the side. Everyone has pushed you to the margin, said that you're not good enough, that God will never use you, that you'll never accomplish great things, but God's got a different thing in mind. He's speaking a better word over your life today. He's saying your earthly father might not use your name, but your heavenly father knows your name. Can we just get an amen in the house today that even though others might disqualify you and push you to the side, I've got a purpose and a plan for you to do great things. And so God told Samuel, go get them. Bring them in. And so David comes in from the field. And we pick up our story here. We're going to keep reading. We're going to be down in verse 12. He says, he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. David looked good too. He was even dirty. He'd been out in the field, been messing with the sheep, but he still was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. In front of the seven rejected ones, David was anointed by God. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. I want to speak today about be the one. Be the one. The one. I changed my message the other day because I was reading this and this, this stuck out and I, I highlighted it in bold. This is the one. And so we want to be the one. David comes in and God says, this is the one. See, by all outward appearances, David's brothers were better suited to be king than David was. But there was a difference there was a difference. He had the heart. He had the heart. Let's look at 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. This is a couple chapters before. This is when Saul is serving as the king and God gets fed up. He's like, I've had my, my last straw with you, Saul. Like, you have messed up for the last time. And so here's God speaking through Samuel to Saul. It says, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. In this story, we have two kings, right? We got 
the king that's currently serving, we got Saul over here on the left side. We got Saul. He's the king that Israel chose, the king that Israel wanted. And then over here, we've got Israel's future king. We've got David that God has chosen. See, Saul was a man after Israel's heart, but David was a man after God's heart. That was the difference. Saul, Israel wanted him. Israel chose him. God chose David because he had the heart. See, Saul sinned, and so God rejected Saul, but it's not because he sinned. See, we all sin. Scripture tells us that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Just because you're a believer in Jesus, just because you're a follower of Christ, doesn't mean you're not going to sin. Sinning doesn't disqualify you from serving God. He was human. We're all human. If, 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 if perfection was the goal, then I might as well sit down and we all can go get an early lunch. Because none of us are perfect. None of us are without sin. None of us. The issue was being a man after God's heart. It wasn't an issue of sin. So God said David was a man after his own heart. So what I want us to look at today is how do we get that heart? How do we become a man or a woman after God's own heart? How do we become the one? And the first thing that I want us to look at is we need to honor the Lord. We need to honor the Lord. See, Saul considered his will more important than God's will. Saul was in it for himself. He wanted his way. He wanted things to play out the way he wanted them to play out. But see, David, he considered God's will more important than his will. And there were times, there were times where David will step outside of God's will. We'll see that as we kind of walk through the next couple weeks. There'll be times that he steps out of God's will. Again, perfection is not the goal. We're, we're never going to achieve perfection. But the difference was is Saul stepped out of God's will because he totally disregarded God's will. Saul was in it for himself. He said, I'm wearing the crown. I've been chosen as the king. I'm tough stuff. I'm all that in a bag of chips. There's no one greater than me. I'm the king of Israel. I've got it figured out. I've got the throne. I've got all that I've ever wanted. I am the king. And God, I don't care what your will is. I want what my will is. But David's over here. When he would step outside of God's will, it would be out of weakness. It was out of weakness. It wasn't because he totally disregarded God or, or, or pushed God to the side and said, I don't care what you say. I want it my way. No, God, no, David was in it for God's will. And when he stepped outside of God's will, it was because of weakness, not because of a total disregard for God. So let me see if I can paint a picture of this for us. Um, we got parents in the house. I know I use my, my child as an example, I think, every time I speak. And so um, she's the Love of my life. I love her to death. There's nothing I wouldn't do for her. But when you're a parent, you're constantly learning, right? Can I get some nodding heads? You know, as they get older, you learn a lot of things. And what we've learned about Charlotte, that I think we can look at our relationship with God in this light. Charlotte, when she was younger, you know, obviously the, the self wants what it wants, when it wants it, how it wants it. And so very impatient. So as, as a baby, she's always reaching for things. She wants things. But she's doing it because... That's just innately a part of who she is. That's, that's how babies operate. That's how kids operate. She's, she's doing it out of weakness. I see the cookie, I want the cookie. And I want all the cookies. And I'm going to eat them when I want them because I want them. And, and my, my mind says that's what I want. And so that's what I'm going to go after. The older they get, you can start to train them. Like, no, we don't eat the cookie. We don't need all the cookies. We're about to eat dinner. But now Charlotte has learned the word No. She'll even point her finger, no, no. That's different. That's different, amen. When the child looks at you and says, no, I don't care that you don't want me to have the cookie. I want the cookie, no. And I look at this story and I'm like, that's what Saul did to God, no. I want what I want and I want it now. And we do the same thing so often as God's children, <laughs> And we sit and we get frustrated at our children for doing the same thing we do to God. 
on a daily basis. See, Saul said, no. But David honored God. He honored the Lord. The second thing that we see David had was he had a repentant heart. See, if we want to be the one, we have to have a repentant heart. See, even as believers, like I said, we're going to sin. We're going to mess up. We're going to step outside of God's will. We're going to mess up. It's not about trying to be perfect. But see, when Saul was confronted with his sin, he tried to make excuses for it. He tried to justify his decisions. He tried to, to reason with God and explain it away. David, on the other hand, when he's confronted with his sin, he had a repentant heart. And if you're familiar with David's life, like I mentioned earlier, there's the story of David and Bathsheba. And this is not illustrated any better than in that story with David and Bathsheba when he messes up. And he messed up royally. Get it? Come on. I know it's early. He messed up royally. And I wrote that in my notes. So yes, the pun was intended this morning. So he messed up royally. This wasn't just a small white lie that he told. No, he looked on a woman with lust in his heart. He committed adultery with her. And then she got pregnant. And to cover it up, he decided to kill her husband. Just sin upon sin upon sin and then deception upon deception. And so the prophet Nathan at that time comes to David and he confronts him about his sin. And David just collapses with a repentant heart because he knew that God's will was more important than his will. He had a repentant heart. And if you want to see an example of what to pray when you mess up, just go to Psalm 51. Just go to Psalm 51. Actually, I'm going to read it. Jimmy's going to get mad because this isn't in the notes. He doesn't have the scripture for the screens, but I'm actually going to read it for us because I want you guys, I want you guys to see this. Um, just bear with me. I'm doing it old school up here. And there's no typing and Google searches today. Psalm 51 says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. How many of us have that heart when we mess up? When we sin against God, or do we just kind of brush it to the side and God just forgive me of my sins and then we go on with our day? No, this was a repentant heart. This was a man that was after God's heart. And when he messed up, he repented of it. He made things right. And so when we mess up, when we sin, we have to have a repentant heart. And so the third thing, not only, did God, not only did David honor the Lord, not only did he have a repentant heart, but he loved people. He loved people. See, Saul over here on the left-hand side, he cared more about himself. He cared more about himself than other people, but David over here loved people. And I think it's important to note that when we find David, where is he? He's out in the field. He's tending the sheep. David was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. And I think if we, if we think about that, God saw David where he was, saw David being faithful and, 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 and shepherding those sheep and loving those sheep, protecting those sheep. And he said, that's the man that I want as the king over Israel. That's the kind of man I want to put over my people. That's the man that I want watching over and protecting my people. I want a man with a shepherd's heart. And so David was out there in the field from a young age, watching the sheep, protecting the sheep, learning how to be a good shepherd. And I think it's even interesting to note that after he's anointed as the next king of Israel, where does David go? He goes right back out into the field because that's where God has him serving at that time. He was faithful to serve where God had him at that time. Even though he was anointed as king, he went back out in the field and he shepherded the sheep. See, all those years, all those years weren't just years of waiting. They were years of training for the mission that was ahead. It, wouldn't, it would be years before he became king. But God was preparing him for the purpose he had for his life. Psalm 78 says this, 
in verse 7 about David. It says, he chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of, say that word, heart, and with skillful hands, he led them. God looked down and he saw David out in the, in the field watching the sheep and said, that's the man that I want watching my people. See, God calls us to love others. Matthew 22, Jesus said this. It says, Jesus replied. Someone had just asked him, you know, what is the greatest commandment? And so Jesus replied. He said, love the Lord your God with all your and with all your soul and with all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. God said, you want to be the one? You got to love people. You got to love people. Even though there's, there's people that are hard to love. How many of you know those people? They're hard to love. I got hit by a person on I-75 yesterday, rammed into the side of me going down the road. In that moment, hard to love. It's hard to shepherd that person. You want to, yeah, you, you, hard to shepherd that person. But God calls us to love people and to even love our enemies at times. So you want to be the one, you got to honor the Lord. You want to be the one, you have to have a repentant heart. You want to be the one, you got to love people. And then lastly, you have to enthrone God as king. You have to enthrone God as king. Again, you have two kings. You've got Saul over here, even chosen by God to be Israel's first king. But see, to Saul, Saul was king. Saul was king. He said, I wear the crown. I sit on the throne. I'm the king. We do what I want to do. And at times, even acted like God served him as king. To Saul, Saul was king. To David, God was king. God was the king. He said, I might wear the crown. I might have the throne. I might have the position, but God, I sit under you because you're the king. You're the capital K, king. I'm not the king, you're the king. If you're familiar with David, you, you understand that he was a songwriter and he wrote a lot of the Psalms in the Bible. A lot of the words we even sing in our songs that we sing here at church were songs that were, and words that were written by David back when he was sitting in the pasture with the sheep, writing these songs about God. But you see, even though David was what you could probably call the first chart-topping worship artist, that's not what made him a worshiper. What made David a worshiper was that God was the priority. God was the king. God was number one. Even though David was destined to wear the crown, he thought it was more important to honor God in all things. See, thought, Saul thought it was important because he thought it would help him win the battle. He thought if you know, if I put God first, God will give me what I want. He'll help me to achieve my goals. That's, that's what Saul's heart was. David's heart over here, he honored God because God was the goal. There's a difference. There's a difference there. Saul was in it because of what he could get out of the relationship. Saul was in it because of what his relationship with God could get him. He wanted to win more battles. He wanted to 
conquer more lands. He wanted just to achieve and, and win the awards and have recognition. David honored God because of God. Because of who God was. See, David had a heart that was after God's heart. How many of you ever strived so hard to get something? Maybe that was a promotion. Maybe that was a boy or a girl in high school. But you, you pursued something so hard. I will give up everything to achieve this one thing. I'll put all my blood, sweat, tears, energy into achieving this one thing. You're after something. You want something so bad. See, David was a man that was after God's heart. He wanted God's heart. He wanted to know God. Psalm 27, David wrote this. Here's one of his songs. One thing I ask for. And this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. One thing, there's only one thing I'm after, is I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know you like I've never known anything else in my life. That's David's heart. That's David's heart. How many times have we ever walked through these doors on a Sunday and our one thing is to know God and to gaze upon his beauty and his majesty and his awesomeness. We try our best every week to give melody and music to words that hopefully will drive you to that place that you see how great and how awesome God is. We put time and energy into preparing a word from the Lord that hopefully helps you see how great God is. But unless you come in with a, with a heart that's postured to see him, it's not gonna happen. And we have to come prepared with our heart open to say, God, there is one thing and one thing only I am after today, and that is to gaze upon you and how great you are. Not because of what I can get out of the relationship, but because I get to have a relationship with you. I don't care if the healing comes. I don't care if the promotion happens. I don't care if she texts me back. I don't care. I'm not praying because I want something. I'm praying because I love you. I love you. And there is nothing on this earth that is worth me striving after than your heart. David was a man after God's heart heart. Psalm 63, he said, you, God, are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. God, I thirst for you. I desire you, and there is nothing else that will satisfy there's nothing else that will quench my thirst for you other than you. Not the answer to my prayer even. That's not what I'm after. I'm just after you. I'm after you. So the question is, does your heart look like that? Does your heart look like David's heart? Are you after God? for God? Or does your heart look more like Saul and you're after him because of what you can get from him? Are you praying and you, are you seeking because you want something so bad 
that you're willing to even use God to get it. Friends, we have to have a heart like David. We have to have a heart that longs for God and God only. Again, not because of what we can get from him, but because of him and him alone. We have to be the one. Be the one. Can you guys bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? No one looking around. This is a moment that God's going to move. I'm going to ask you just to sit still here for a moment. If you're joining us online, don't log off, don't click off. God's got something he wants to do. He's probably already doing it. His spirit's already moving. He's already speaking to hearts. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't even know God. It's not that I've believed in him and I've walked away. I don't even know God at all. I want to lead you in a simple prayer this morning. And I know we don't do this often, but I believe God wants us to do this today because there's somebody here that needs to receive God's gift of salvation. And so if you're here today, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer. If you're already a believer, I encourage you, like, pray with us and pray for those that are praying this prayer. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of all my sins. Make me brand new. I believe Jesus died for me, rose again, so I could live for you. Fill me with your spirit so I can know you, serve you, and follow you the rest of my life. My life is not my own. Today, I give it to you. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a few more minutes. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to look up at me. I want you to just look up at me all across the room. If you prayed that prayer this morning, if you accepted Jesus, I see you. I see you this morning. What I want you to do is first, I want to say how excited I am that you've taken this step in your walk with Jesus. There's a next step card in the seat in front of you or in the seat behind you. I want you to take that card and I want you to check the box that says salvation. I want you to check that box. There should be a pen there in the seat pocket with the card. And I want you to take that card today and I want you to go to Next Step Central when the service is over. There's someone there that's going to meet you, that's going to celebrate with you the decision that you've made. And they're going to help you take your next step. Justin's going to come in a bit and he's going to talk about those next steps but maybe today you're here and you're like, I am a follower of Jesus. I've believed him. I've been a Christian for, you know, a week, a month, years even. But there's a part of my heart that I'm holding back that I have not fully surrendered to Jesus. My heart looks more like Saul's heart and not David's heart. If that's you today, can you just raise your hand? Can you just raise your hand? all across the room. My heart doesn't look like David's heart. I want you to spend some time when we sing this song in a minute. I just want you to pray, God, would you forgive me for not surrendering my whole heart to you, but God, right now I surrender it to you. I open myself up to be used by you. Father, we thank you for all that you are. We thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. And on the third day, he walked out victorious over the grave. And God, if you would do that for us, the least we can do 
is open our heart to receive it. To surrender our whole heart to you. And so God, in response of all that you've done for us, we give you our heart. We surrender to you, to be used by you. Our whole life, we hold nothing back. We keep nothing for ourselves. We're not in this for ourselves, God. We're in this for you. God, we give you our heart. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.